So thank you, Henry, and thanks for inviting me, and nice to see you all here. And I would talk a little bit about, as uh, Henry said, about the implications of this to the IAEA work. But as he mentioned, this has also implications to arms control and even for the disarmament, which might take a little bit surprise some of you. And let's start from the IAEA. IAEA's safeguard system is based on deterrence by early detection if someone wants to divert nuclear material, like plutonium for undeclared or clandestine purposes or nuclear weapons. And there are basically two major parameters how it works. One is the quantity you want to detect when it's diverted, and what are the physical characteristics of that quantity, like plutonium, reactor grade plutonium, uh, or weapons grade plutonium. Or enriched uranium, high enriched uranium, and to which level you want to go. An equally important number is then the detection time. How well in advance you will see that this amount will disappear from the inventory, which is the detection time. Uh, if we look today's world, and let's start from the spent fuel and plutonium in spent fuel and separated plutonium. 450 reactors are currently operational worldwide. Their current inventory of plutonium is sp in spent fuel is 400 tons. So quite a few nuclear weapons you can make. And those inventories are going to increase because there's practically no plutonium re re recycling apart from Russia and France today. All the others are practically accumulating this. Uh, Plutonium, and every year there is, as uh, Greg mentioned, typical light water reactor. Perhaps a quarter of ton plutonium, will, metric ton, will come out and s sits there in the spent fuel. Verification of that is fairly easy. So, the agency has good systems, measurement systems, and you have time because even if someone captures that plutonium, it will take time to s separate it and turn it to material which is suitable for weapons purposes. And the IAEA uses normally uh, three months detection time for that process. So every three months you make them sure that not one significant quantity of spent fuel is missing from the stocks. But then it gets much more, much more problematic with the plutonium, and particularly now we also with these findings of uh, Greg. Uh, there are 270 tons plutonium out there, fresh, unirradiated plutonium, which can be any time converted to nuclear weapons purposes. Conversion doesn't take very long time. If you have prepared everything, it's a matter of a week or two when you take the plutonium nitrate or plutonium powder and turn it to the plutonium metal, machine it to the proper shape, and you have material for your nuclear pit. Out of these 270 tons, uh, about close to 90 tons is actually under IAEA control. 10 tons is in, uh, in Japan, as uh, he mentioned, and then there's actually quite big quantities in the UK and elsewhere. And I think that here is then the, perhaps the first problem, because the two, three months, weeks is not a very long time in international community. And you are just looking plutonium. You are not uh, looking at anything else. If you only look that plutonium is uh, accountancy and verification is your only tool to make sure that someone doesn't dash to nuclear weapon, I think you will lose the game with the longer term. Because nuclear energy, uh, weapon is actually it's a, like a pole with ten pole in a tent with two poles in a tent. One is the nuclear material and plutonium and one is the nuclear device and delivery vehicle. So what you do, you uh, develop your delivery systems, you deliver, develop your nuclear weapon design, but you don't touch plutonium. And then when you are ready, you dash with the uh, integration and making it to weapon. And there is no international system today which controls missiles which are developed for 
uh, nuclear weapons. Certainly, this is a proscribed activity in, uh, in a non-proliferation treaty for the countries which are non-nuclear weapon states. But there's no limitation for any other country, like North Korea. In that sense, there are some other limitations somewhere else. So we have a challenge here. And I think that the, one of the challenges is that the IAEA verification system under the NPT needs to be modified. There's a big dispute in the international community. Should the IAEA start to follow nuclear weaponization activities? Because it may contribute at the same time to proliferation, which actually it should be fighting against. But I don't think that we can leave long time with expanding plutonium, particularly fresh plutonium stocks, unless we start to look deeper to the weaponization activities. And a good example was two weeks ago when you saw the cache of uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, which was actually most of this was not only this picture which Henry showed, but you saw there are other stuff which were to do with the hemispheres and some hydrodynamic tests to, to see how the implosion proceeds, etc. So this is an area where the international community has now to think how we combat against uh, proliferation there so that we find in advance those things which take place. And for, for example, to the IAEA, and if they control plutonium, they have also to look what is the inspected party doing with the plutonium, not just accounting. What's the purpose? Is this a plausible use? How these facilities have been designed? Are there any indicators that they are not, for example, producing mixed oxide fuel for uh, fast breeders, but uh, they are working with plutonium metal, which is entirely different ball game, and the only real explanation is a weaponization. So this is something what we, what we need to look now in the light of these findings. Then there is also another weakness of the NPT which has been there a long time, but uh, needs to be addressed. And this is the withdrawal from the NPT. So you, d you accumulate your plutonium stock, let the IAEA to measure. And then when you are de ready, you withdraw from the NPT by uh, uh, claiming that your national security is compromised. This is a uh, provision in the NPT. One country has done it, North Korea. We see the result, and there has to be some more radical measures when this takes place in order to close the patient path for the nuclear weapons that you develop everything and then you just decide to quit. And you have seen also in the last few months that some of the Iranian uh, high-level officials like uh, Admiral Shamkhani has presented ideas that, you know, if this JCPOA doesn't go properly, we will withdraw from the NPT. And there is not very much we can do at this stage if they have already developed all the capabilities. And then last and not the least, and this is an important point for the future and for the disarmament, and this is a fissile material cutoff treaty. A week from now, we convene again, I'm part of the group which makes recommendations for the elements of the, such a treaty. And one of the disputes we, we have there is, what is fissile material? What will be the definition for fissile material subject to this treaty? And here, the international community is pretty much split. Some of the nuclear weapon states, like uh, Russia, advocates that actually the treaty, only treaty obligated material should be a weapons grade plutonium, plutonium which has more than 95 percent 239 isotope is actually even more pure than what Craig presented here. At the same time, if there is a country who wants to develop nuclear weapons from the cre reactor grade material, I think that in the best position to do that is a nuclear weapon state. So at the same time, nuclear weapon states are worried that the non-nuclear weapon state may decide to go and build a nuclear weapon from reactor grade material, but they think that they would never go. Sure, their stocks for weapon grade plutonium are today high, but with the time, it may be different. And then we have also the smaller nuclear states with the nuclear weapons, whose stocks are much less. 
So this is also, I think, an important contribution, this book, to this debate. And I will take your book there and publicate some less pleasant feedback. So thank you. <laughs>